All right, hello everyone. Eric, what was that? You miss, I miss you too. Eric Marks here again with FindingMiddleEarth.com. And today we're gonna to talk about uh, my experience with the Fujifilm gear, uh, adding that in to my existing Nikon equipment. I know a lot of people think that I ditched Nikon and went to Fuji, but I've shot Nikon all my life and my Nikon gear isn't going anywhere. I just introduced uh, some Fujifilm stuff into it. So this is kind of like uh, a year later of shooting with the Fujifilm X-T2 for landscape photography and other genres as well. Uh, okay, so before we get started, if you guys head on over to my uh, website at findingmiddleearth.com, you click the big subscribe button in the top right, uh, just pop your email in the box and you'll get access to a free 45 minute video talking about all my gear, going through my camera bags, uh, my favorite lenses, etc., etc. Also, if you head over to my store, uh, my landscape photography processing and blending tutorial uh, over 10 hours of footage on how to use Photoshop uh, is on sale right now from $99 to $25. And it's gonna be on sale uh, through the rest of this month. So go ahead and pick that up. It's a really great price. I just wanted to make it super affordable. Okay, so uh, moving on. Let's talk about these, these cameras. So like I said, I've shot Nikon all my life. Um, I've just always liked the Nikon dynamic range. I like Nikon uh, bodies, the build quality, the lenses. I've just always loved the Nikon stuff. So about a year and one month ago or so, uh, but yeah, about a year and one month, I picked up a Fujifilm X-T2. Okay, for the, it's the first time I've ever really shot with Fujifilm X gear. It's definitely the first Fujifilm uh, X camera that I owned other than uh, the original X100 that I did own for a brief period, but I didn't really mess around with it a lot. So let's just call this my first actual Fujifilm X camera, the X-T2. And uh, as soon as I, I opened it up and started shooting with it, I was hooked, okay? I loved it. I love uh, how much fun it was to shoot with. It was just like a very like whimsical shooting experience. It was just very fun. Uh, I loved the size. I liked the ergonomics. I liked that you could get a battery grip that actually added features to the camera. The lenses were brilliant, the colors. Uh, it was all great. I was just in that like honeymoon period, right? Where I was just like in love with this stuff. So now we're, we're here we are a year later. Um, and uh, at this point I have, what, seven Fujifilm lenses. Uh, I have an X-T1 as well. Uh, this is the 10 to 24 lens. This is the 16 to 55 lens. And uh, this is a brilliant little lens, brilliant cameras. And I'm just gonna talk about uh, where we are today with these. So I have my phone to keep me on track here. So let's talk about the first topic here. First topic, let's talk about build quality. Okay, so build quality wise, um, again, I come from Nikon Pro Bodies. Uh, I've used D3, D4s, uh, the D810s, D800s, okay? So I'm used to really good beefy cameras, good build quality. Uh, I wasn't disappointed at all with the X-T2. Uh, it was great build quality. I love the rubberized little nub here for my thumb because I kind of have big hands. Um, I loved that the viewfinder was so bright and brilliant and huge. That was great for me because uh, I was definitely um, kind of an optical viewfinder snob when I stumbled onto the Fujifilm system. It took me a little bit longer than most people to get used to the EVF. I know a lot of people love them, but I'm still kind of a, a viewfinder snob. I like my, I like my old school. Uh, optical viewfinders, but it's been great. It's, it's like staring into a big screen TV. I got used to it after a little while and it really is brilliant. Um, I, I almost just don't even like using the display on this thing anymore because the resolution difference between the display and the EVF are worlds apart and the EVF is so sharp. I almost do all my image reviewing just looking through the viewfinder and zooming in because it's so, so sharp and bright. Uh, so I love that. Again, uh, build quality, is just fantastic. It's weather sealed. Uh, I've had this in extreme weather, extreme colds, uh, not extreme heat, but I've had it up to 98 degrees Fahrenheit, so pretty darn hot. Uh, and it's never, it's never failed. It's never uh, overheated or shut off in the cold or anything. Uh, it's just been great. So build quality, I give this uh, an A plus. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, so let's talk about the next category real quick. So I can keep myself organized here on my phone. Uh, let's talk about the firmware and menu system. So for this, um, in my actual review on my, uh, I did a full review by the way, I'll pause real quick. If, if you're interested in my full review after using this for a few months, uh, head over to my website, uh, findingmiddleearth.com and I'll post the link in the description directly to the review. I did, a, I did a very long comprehensive review on this thing with a lot of image examples and everything. Uh, so you can go ahead and check that out. So the firmware and menu system on this, uh, I had a, a few complaints with um, as far as the way that the, 
uh, X-T2 connected with the iPhone and the Fujifilm app. I think that needed a lot of work and I still think it needs some work, um, but let's talk about the firmware for the camera. Okay, the firmware I have no complaints with because Fujifilm just decides to, to randomly come out with these firmware updates that gives you features without having to pay for anything. You don't have to pay for an upgraded model like these incremental models like Nikon does, right? Or Canon with these like the, the, the 5D Mark, Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, and the Nikon D3, D3S, D4, D4S, all these little tiny jumps. Fujifilm just says, you know, screw it. We're not gonna waste the time and money to come out with an entirely different camera and screw over our customers. We're just gonna give, them, give it to them in a firmware update. And that's what they do. And it's been fantastic. Um, I think since I've owned this thing, there's been, I think, what, two or three major upgrades? I think two major firmware updates that have improved the autofocus tracking uh, that have my biggest complaint with the autofocus system in my original view. Uh, sorry, my original review uh, is that you couldn't get the tiny autofocus points uh, to pinpoint the eyes like you can on some of the DSLRs. And they, they released that a few months later after my review in the, um, in the firmware update. You can do the tiny, tiny autofocus point to place it right over the eyeball. Uh, so that was fantastic. So it seems like most of the complaints that I had in my original review have actually just been fixed in firmware upgrades. So, uh, for firmware, that's probably the most exciting and exhilarating thing about owning a Fujifilm camera is that you could just wake up one morning and get like a, a Christmas present from Fujifilm that says, oh, by the way, uh, you know, you didn't have 4K video yesterday. Well, today you have 4K video um, or, you know, oh, you only had 100 focus points. Well, now you have a thousand focus points. Merry Christmas. And that's what's been the coolest thing about the firmware. Uh, the firmware deal is that they just... Uh, they just release the firmware, you know, fairly, fairly often and give you free stuff. They, they don't come out with, with different cameras, which I really respect. That's, that's a, a company that really cares about its customers. So I love that. Okay, next category. Uh, let's see, let's talk about uh, the autofocus system. So for the autofocus system, like I said, one of my bigger complaints was that um, the autofocus point didn't get tiny enough, the single point didn't get tiny enough to go over the eyeball. They fixed that. Um, the other complaint that I had in my original review was that the, uh, the autofocus tracking default mode wasn't quite as good as it should be without having to tweak some things. Now, the autofocus tracking on the X-T2, I think is absolutely brilliant. I I've used it in multiple different situations, wildlife, chasing my two-year-old daughter around the yard, which is as good of a test as any, in my opinion, because she's so fast and she never stays still. Um, and it's been great. And so the, the thing about the in default mode, it hasn't, None of the firmware upgrades has really uh, helped it in that respect, just to be able to flip, flick it into AFC, uh, autofocus continuous on default mode and just have it track awesome. It tracks good, it just doesn't track as good as it can. It's like world's difference if you actually go into the custom menu and change things around. Uh, so what I did was I spent a lot of time um, studying the different modes and seeing exactly how the camera behaved in each of the different custom modes uh, of the autofocus system. So uh, I actually made a video about it on how to tweak your autofocus for your X-T2. So you can go ahead and uh, click up here and watch that. I'll also put that in the description. So it's a whole video on how to tweak your AFC custom settings so that you can get the fastest tracking for the uh, right situation for what you're doing. So go ahead and check that video out because it took a long time to just kind of study what the modes do and how it behaves and reacts differently. But uh, you know, all in all, it's I don't have really any big complaints. It's great autofocus, especially compared to um, you know, like my D810 for example, right? This thing's not gonna track well at all. It's just it's just made to sit there and take beautiful landscapes and portraits. Um, now my D7200, you know, this thing definitely focuses uh, a good bit faster and I love this camera, but uh, the X-T2 still even blows away the D7200 when it comes to just raw tracking and autofocus acquisition. However, um, comparing these two a little bit, the 7200 with the X-T2, I think the um, D7200 will actually uh, acquire autofocus in low light um, about as fast as the X-T2 in low light, I've noticed, which is impressive. This thing, um, I measured it on an exposure meter and this thing will actually acquire uh, autofocus in about a negative four EV setting. Uh, it's it's marketed to do negative, I mean, neg yeah, negative three EV, but I actually had it in a negative four EV situation and uh, it killed it with this uh, Nikkor 247028 lens. It just, it killed it. It, it uh, acquired autofocus, no problem. So the X-T2 did the same thing and they did it about at the same speed. So that was an interesting test if you care about that. Um, so anyway, for autofocus, definitely love it. It's very fast um, and 
well, I'll just take a second to say the autofocus capabilities on this for a camera at this price point, uh, what, what is the body now, $15.99, uh, is just ridiculous. The value for what you get for $15.99 is ridiculous. Um, now, keep in mind if you add the battery grip, okay, you have the boost mode function uh, on the back here. And if you uh, flick that over to boost mode, then you get, uh, you unlock 10 frames per second capability on the camera and uh, Fujifilm also claimed that it boosts the autofocus performance as well. And while I haven't ever been able to actually like, you know, check the facts and see if it actually does boost or tweak the autofocus, they claim it does, so we can only believe them, um, but it definitely does give you the, the ripping fast 10 frames per second, which is awesome. Okay, let's talk about the next category here, and this is a big one for me. Uh, let's talk about dynamic range. So for dynamic range, um, it's good, but it's not fantastic. Now, you're probably thinking compared to what? Now, if I was shooting you know, Canon or you know, another camera brand, I might say, wow, this dynamic range is absolutely amazing. But remember, I've been shooting with my uh, D800Es and my D810 for years, and you just can't beat the dynamic range on these Nikon cameras, especially the D810. What is this thing clocking at? 14.8 or 14.9 stops of dynamic range. I can just dig the shadows out of this thing for days and days and get almost no degradation in quality. And the noise is minimal, if any at all. It's, this thing has just impressed the heck out of me since day one with dynamic range. So here's the weird part, right? So uh, I think that the X-T2 can recover highlights about as good as the, as the D810, maybe even a little bit better, uh, but it still recovers uh, hi the highlights about as good, okay, between the D810 and the X-T2. But for the shadows, uh, it's a whole different story. I think the shadows are very muddy and very noisy on the X-T2 if you're not shooting in good light. Uh, but if you're shooting in, in you know, bad light or low light with the D810, you're still going to get really nice color and really nice shadows. Uh, obviously, depending on the lighting situation, if it's outdoor or fluorescent or something, um, you know, with, with bad like green color cast or yellow color cast. But if you're just talking about going outdoors, low light, blue hour or something, and you're shooting uh, an image that's a little bit underexposed, I have lifted the shadows 100% across three different raw processors on the D810 and the X-T2, and the X-T2 shows up very muddy and very colory, noisy uh, almost every time, and the D810 is almost, it's like 80% flawless almost every time and can be fixed easily with just a little bit of noise reduction. Uh, now I can fix the X-T2 as well with some noise reduction, but it still just shows up a little muddy, the color is gone, it's a little, it almost turns a little bit gray um, instead of you know the, the natural color renderings that, that Fuji is known for. So, um, yeah, well, it's the dynamic range. Not, again, the, the whole issue here is compared to what, right? The, the dynamic range is very, very good, very, very good. But when, you, when I compare it to what I'm used to on the D810, um, it was a little bit of a letdown because you know I, I shoot landscapes all the time and I'm just used to my D810 quality. Uh, and so comparing those two, it was just a, it was just different, right? Let's not say good or bad, it was just different. So uh, definitely not as good as that of the D810, but again, for value and for what you're getting, it's still very good, very impressive. Um, so let's go on to the next category here, keeping myself organized. All right, let's talk about uh, ISO performance, okay? So um, for ISO performance, I will say that it was very impressive. Um, and here's something kind of funky to add into this too. I own an X-T1 as well, and even the X-T1 uh, is very, very impressive in low light, uh, which is kind of crazy, because this is the, um, the first version of the X-T2, and this one is uh, 16 megapixels, which might have something to do with that. It's a lower megapixel count. And even this thing at like 6400 ISO is very impressive for what it is. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. But on the X-T2, um, I did an ISO comparison video between this and my D810, and I cranked it all the way up to 12,800, and again, 12,800 ISO, uh, at a properly metered exposed image, uh, I think the X-T2 looked a little better in, in my testing. Um, it's it just, the colors looked more natural. There wasn't quite as much color noise when it was properly exposed. Uh, the image was just a tad bit sharper. Um, now, most of my tests were done shooting like text, you know, indoors, focused in all different kinds of lighting. And uh, I know full frame cameras are supposed to be known to just 
you know, be cleaner at higher ISOs. And in certain situations, the D810 might beat it, but the D810 was not known to be a low light camera. Now, if we compare it to my D7200, they're very on par with each other. The 7200 does have very impressive ISO performance, but both of these put together, you could never, you never even touch the D500. So if you want an APS-C camera with low light, just a low light monster, get the Nikon D500 and call it a day. Uh, but for ISO performance in general, uh, I would feel comfortable, let's say that I'm an event photographer or something, I would feel comfortable shooting this at 6400. At 12,800 it looks good, but I'd still be a little bit worried on delivering that to a client unless I just absolutely had to get the shot, there was no other way to get it, I would just crank it up to 12,800 take the shot and then do some noise reduction later in post. But 6400 all day long, I would shoot this at and just a little bit of noise reduction tre uh, treatment and a little bit of proper sharpening and it looks great. Uh, I, I've done that multiple times with this. So very happy with the ISO performance. I definitely can't complain there, especially since I had much lower expectations going in since it was an APS-C sensor. I didn't expect it to be as good as it actually is. Uh, okay, so let's move on to uh, my next category here. Uh, so let's just talk about just briefly handling and ergonomics. So for, for that aspect of the camera, um, I think it's, it's really all based on personal opinion. I, I don't think I can just speak to you and say, oh, the camera handle is amazing because I have big hands and some people might have smaller hands and can't reach the buttons as much. It, it's really a personal preference thing. So if you really, if, if handling and ergonomics are what is kind of like leaning you one way or the other on purchasing this camera, I would say to just rent one or go to a camera store and pick it up for yourself because the handling and ergonomics is different for everybody, right? Some people like a shorter grip, some people like a deeper grip, uh, like for, me, for example, I don't like the Nikon D750, D500, like the deeper grip. I like the shallower grip on my D810, but that's just me. I know a lot of people love the deeper grip. So that's just personal preference. But in my experience, uh, I have liked the ergonomics. Um, I do think that uh, a, a, a deeper grip on this might be a little nice. Uh, however, I do think it was brilliant of them to put that little nub on the back here so that your thumb doesn't slide off. Uh, that was nice. Uh, I wish this function button right here had a little bit more room for my big fingers or a little, maybe a little different place on the camera because I do find that I get my finger kind of stuck in between these two dials trying to get to it sometimes and I'll even like bump my exposure comp dial. Uh, so, you know, as far as that, that's, that's really the only uh, complaint there just for me personally, uh, but I have no clue if anyone else, you know, has that. Um, Handling and ergonomics again, I, I mean, I think with the battery grip for me, it makes a, a lot of difference. I love being able to have the, the grip on the battery grip is actually uh, deeper than this grip here. So I do prefer shooting like this if I am if I can <laughs> in portrait mode, just because the, the grip is so nice to hold it like this versus this. Um, and then as far as the placement of the other custom function buttons, I love this function button right here. Um, it's perfect for my, my middle finger. I have this one assigned to the uh, face tracking and eye tracking autofocus because I just pop it real quick and use my dials in the back uh, and I'm good. So yeah, I mean, I can't really complain about handling and ergonomics. I think it's nice. Uh, with the battery grip on here and a bigger lens, the, this chunky 16 to 55 lens, I think it balances it very nice uh, with the weight of the battery grip. Uh, and then I love the fact of, uh, the fact of course that the uh, with the battery grip, it still allows you to keep a battery in the camera. So you can go uh, two batteries in here and one in here. So you're shooting with three batteries, a lot of power. So uh, yeah, I love that. So uh, handling and ergonomics just quickly compared to this. Um, all day long, I can tell you I prefer my D810 on handling and ergonomics. I just pick it up and it just fits in this pocket and I love it. I just, it's perfect. Even with the L bracket on there, it's just a perfect weight. I like the heavier cameras. I'm okay with that. I didn't buy this because I want a lighter solution. Um, so yeah, I, I think all day long I would still prefer uh, my Nikon cameras, even my 7200 has a really nice grip for me. Uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, I think handling and ergonomics, again, can't complain because we're talking about the X-T2. But since we're also talking about um, the X-T2 versus my Nikon stuff, um, I think that I would still prefer my Nikon gear over handling and ergonomics and the feel of the camera. But again, can't complain. It's definitely better than uh, most of the other mirrorless stuff that I've tried for sure. So um, at the end of this video, by the way, uh, I'm gonna answer the question, like this, this age old question of, 
that I get all the time, which is now that I've shot with the, X, the Fuji X series cameras now for so long, uh, a year and a month to be exact, uh, do I miss my Nikon stuff and am I going back to my Nikon stuff and I'm gonna sell these or something? Uh, so I'll answer that question at the end of this video. But first let's move on to a couple of other categories that you guys might be interested in. Uh, I guess we can talk about video for a second. So yeah, so let's, let's talk about video. Um, I don't do a whole lot of video on the X-T2, uh, but I do have two comments about it. So um, a lot of people are obsessed with the Canon uh, dual pixel autofocus uh, tracking. And I think the continuous autofocus tracking in video on the X-T2 is actually very, very good. Uh, if this had face tracking, I think it might even give Canon a run for their money. Um, because even without face tracking, this thing seems to do a very, very good job at keeping up with me when I've vlogged with it before. I've done a lot of like just little tests walking away from it and left and right, and it seems to be very good at video autofocus. Um, but if it had the face tracking, I think it might actually give Canon a run for their money. So the great thing is, who knows, you know, who's to say that in a couple of months, we're not gonna wake up and Fujifilm's, you know, gonna have a firmware update that says, hey, you guys have face tracking autofocus and video now. That's the great thing is. Um, that's what the, what's one of the many great things about Fujifilm. Uh, so yeah, video autofocus, I think it's perfectly acceptable, um, but if, if you are a vlogger, you're probably gonna want something with face tracking just because it, you know, it, the dual pixel autofocus can't be beat right now on Canon stuff. Um, as far as the quality of the video, I've shot in 4K with this quite a bit now, and I, I love it. You know, I'm, I, I'm not gonna go into talking about log profiles and codecs and all that because I just don't understand a lot of that stuff. I'm not a video guy. So that's why I don't really comment on a lot of video stuff because I'm not going to bore you with it. Uh, I'm not a video expert. So uh, yeah, but I, it, it's perfectly fine for the stuff that I use it for. Um, the biggest complaint when it comes to video, I guess you can call this video, uh, is the, the communication between the phone and the X-T2. When I try to use this as a live view screen, since the, the screen on the X-T2 doesn't flip all the way out, uh, I try to use this to film myself, and for some reason, uh, if, you, if you're using the phone to uh, preview what you're doing on your camera, it won't allow your X-T2 to record uh, higher than 720p video. So that's just crazy. I don't know why that is. I don't care if you're giving me a 720p preview on my phone, but at least allow the camera to record in 1080 or 4K or something. So hopefully they fix that in a firmware update. To my knowledge, they haven't fixed it yet, uh, but who knows, they may have fixed it in the last firmware update. I haven't even updated the last firmware update yet. I've been so busy. So maybe they did, I'm not sure. Let me know in the comments if they've fixed that yet. I don't think they have, but if they did, I'll be a very happy boy. So yeah, you can't, for some reason, while you're pre previewing the video on the phone, you cannot record past 7, 720p. You're stuck in 720, uh, I'm just gonna call it standard def, even though 720 is HD. In this day and time with 8K video, it's basically standard definition. I don't wanna record videos in 720. So I hope they fix that so I can go back to recording in 4K on this uh, for when I film myself because it's, it's almost impossible to film myself without seeing anything. So that would be another awesome thing is if they make a fully articulating flip out screen uh, for the next iteration of this, that would be great. But I can't complain about the screen. It's, you know, it's, it's not bad at all. So let's see if there's any, any other category I wanna talk about here. Uh, I think I covered everything. So yeah, so, all right, so let's talk about the conclusion real quick. So the conclusion of this is that uh, I've had an absolute blast with these cameras. Um, I'm so glad that I went with Fujifilm and didn't you know, test any other of the mirrorless cameras because I've, I've played around with some Sony stuff and I just was not impressed. It's, the Sony stuff got on my nerves, to be honest. Uh, I love the color coming out of the Fuji X-Trans sensors. I love Fujifilm as a company, the way they, they continuously show that they care about their customers. Um, and another great thing is that it, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a bad Fujinon lens. Uh, remember, camera bodies aren't everything. The most important thing is the glass that you put in front of that sensor. And Fuji glass is fantastic, especially for the price. Uh, it's, it's just mind boggling. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the conclusion is I love this stuff. Um, and I love my Nikon stuff. So here's the question, right? Eric, do you miss your Nikon stuff? Uh, yeah, I have missed it a little bit, I'll be honest. I, I've shot Nikon all my life, and for this past year and one month, I have shot 90% Fujifilm so that I could really keep you guys up to date and give you guys an actual real-time updates on the, the highs and the lows that I've experienced with these cameras. And I always give you those on YouTube videos or Facebook posts or whatever. And you guys have, have kind of been along this journey with me. But 
I love my Nikon stuff and I do miss it a little bit and I have been shooting with this lately which is why right around Christmas time when Zeiss was doing their rebate sale I got myself a little Christmas present and uh, I did get the Zeiss 21 millimeter Milvis this brand new lens for my D810 and it, it just kind of like re-excited me to shoot with my Nikon stuff again and this lens by the way is unbelievable um, so speaking of this Zeiss Milvis lens quickly uh, I have a NovaFlex adapter on the way to adapt the Nikon F mount to Fuji X mount so that way I can use this brilliant Zeiss lens on the Fuji bodies um, so yeah, I, I have that, uh, and then I have my D7200 and my uh, 2470 Nikkor 28, and this is the uh, the original 28 lens, by the way. I've had a lot of people ask about the the new VR version or whatever. Uh, this lens is just brilliant. Okay, it, I mean, why fix something that ain't broke, right? Um, I think that this lens, which is the uh, first version has better contrast, better sharpness, better color than the new version. And it doesn't have VR, and I don't really care about VR on this. So yeah, the, the original 24728 is just fine. It's absolutely brilliant. So um, yeah, I went from D810 to D7200 to shooting with these for this past year. And uh, what, what has impressed me is that I don't have any big complaints, right? It wasn't like life shattering to where I had to go back to my Nikons. Yes, I miss my Nikons, but I love these. And the great thing is at the end of this year, there's room in my kit for, for all of these cameras. And I love them all equally just about, okay, we know, we all know my, my secret obsession with my D810 is never going to go away. I just love this camera, <laughs> but, um, I really do have the same kind of love for the Fuji stuff. And, you know, I, I might end up selling the X-T2 at some point uh, if to, get to look into an X-T3 or whatever the other X cameras. And I'll say this at the, uh, this is at the very end. If any of you have stuck around this video to get this last comment, uh, this might be the most controversial thing I'll say the entire video. Uh, but lately, I don't know why, okay, lately I have been uh, tending to shoot more with the X-T1 because the more I look at the files and I can't, before I say this, okay, I know there's going to be a lot of interesting comments on this. I can't prove this. I didn't scientifically test this. It's just from my experience looking at the images inside of Capture One, okay, for, for the past year. Um, I tend to pick this up more lately, the X-T1. For some reason, the X-T1 files just look <laughs> insanely crisp, but I don't know why. It's a 16 megapixel X-Trans sensor. This is a 24 megapixel X-Trans sensor. And there's two reasons why I've been picking this up more. Number one, because these just look insanely crisp. I don't know if they're sharper than these. It looks it looks like it to me. Okay, I don't know what the issue is there because um, you can get absolutely bonkers sharp images from this. I've printed a 20 by 30, but uh, maybe, maybe it's just because I've just realized the X-T1 is also just a freaking brilliant camera. Uh, number two is that I have been kind of in the mood to shoot sun stars lately, okay? The little sun star effects. And it gets on my nerves that when I shoot sun stars with the X-T2, uh, this sensor has this issue where when you shoot a sun star, it kind of shoots off this purple grid pattern on the sensor. And you can't get rid of it unless you wanna to try to spend five hours in Photoshop getting rid of it, or unless I found out if you hide a little bit of the sun, like under a horizon or behind a tree, you can get it to go away. But if you just shoot directly into the sun at like F16, trying to get a sun star, you'll get this funky purple grid pattern with the X-T2. With the X-T1, doesn't happen at all. There's no grid pattern because it is a different sensor. So lately, I've been picking up the X-T1 and been perfectly fine with it. So who knows, at some point I might sell the X-T2 to look into the, a new uh, X camera, or I might end up actually just selling this, uh, the X-T2, being okay with my X-T1, and then just sticking with this as my X camera, selling this to save up for the Fujifilm GFX uh, in a few years when I can save to get the money for that. So uh, the GFX is definitely on my list, and I'm, I'll probably wait for iteration number two of the GFX. Um, but that's, you know, that's the only one that's on my list. And again, it's more of a want than a need. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're running a business here. So if, if I ever find photo gear that I don't really need, it's more of a want, then I'll just sell it anyway to put the money into marketing and finding more clients and doing stuff for you guys. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, constantly trying to switch things up and make things more fresh for the channel and do bigger productions and, uh, still working on creating my online photography school. Uh, I have news on that coming soon, so that'll be, uh, I think in the next couple of videos, I'll have something released on that, so you guys can actually be able to join like a monthly program and pay for, for my content to be able to get premium tutorial stuff. Uh, but yeah, 
I know I'm just kind of rambling on here. At the end of the day, the Fuji X series are fantastic. The Nikon series are fantastic. And the fact that I have both of them really speaks to the fact that I didn't have to ditch either one to make myself feel good or bad about switching from DSLR to mirrorless or mirrorless to DSLR. There's room for both of them. And I love shooting with both of them. And it's as simple as that. I like having Nikon and Fujifilm. I'm happier that way instead of ditching one and just picking another. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it's about the images. So go outside, turn off my video and take some more photos. Thanks for watching everyone. Take care. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you would like to find out more about me and how you can improve your photography, please check out my premium tutorials at findingmiddleearth.com slash store.